teams now, and uh, I will put, be putting them back on YouTube for anybody uh, who misses. So, well, well, thank you all for being here today. As always, that is an uh, amazing list and group of people here. So I appreciate you guys spending a few times with us or a few minutes with us for the STARS meeting. Um, I will not uh, continue to not make 40 people try to introduce themselves on an online meeting, um, but you can see um, the participant list. Um, and uh, as always, thank you there, especially for anybody new who hasn't uh, been to these before. Uh, we appreciate you joining us for the start of 2023. Uh, we're going to do uh, just some kudos. Uh, I got two call reviews lined up for today. Um, Morella is pretty awesome, so we already have all of 2022's metrics put together um, to talk about last year, um, and then we'll go to just some changes upcoming for this year. Um, so I did. Uh, I have to give a kudos to SCAD who hosted a drive-through party um, for their kiddos out there. Um, it was a a good time, uh, even with the Grinch in play. So um, it's really an amazing setup. Um, I certainly encourage uh, any other districts who are, if you're trying to think of some things to do or if you want to come up with an event, um, whether you want to ask me how SCAD does it or go talk to our friends over at SCAD, but they do have a drive through, um, which really works super well for the families and, and is probably something that could be replicated um, at other agencies if you want to try something like that. So. Um, good to see on that. Um, uh, kudos to, to MedStar. Just they had a, a good call um, and they really focused on like some early activation and communicating um, with, uh, you know, all parties involved, making sure the hospital was aware uh, early on a kind of a sick case. So it was just uh, really well done on their part. Um, and then I, I, I don't know if I'll ever be able to go a month without thanking Union EMS. Um, but uh, they did a phenomenal job, as always, of managing um, their super thick star that they have in their area um, as he can kind of uh, evolve with his, de uh, his disease process and get sicker. So, uh, we're going to do a, a call review, um, just a kind of a short one here um, for one of uh, our stars. Um, this is a both call reviews are actually seizure calls today. Um, but this one, uh, you can see we got a morning call. Um, they did have a super long transport time. Um, they bypassed several hospitals um, to drive directly to us. Um, and so some things that just, you know, stood out to me, um, you know, once again, that atypical seizure presentation um, where we're not sure all of our providers would look at this and be like, oh, yes, that kid is seizing for sure or not. Um, and so um, some deferral to mom. Mom confirmed, yes, this is what it looks like. Um, and then, um, you know, they proceeded to treat um, kind of a theme you'll get out of both of these two. Um, but uh, it kind of, you know, it strikes me that we spend a lot of time training to be the initial care providers. But in a lot of these um, situations with our kiddos, parents have already rendered some treatments in some ways that it looks more like a transfer, right? Like you show up and people are already doing stuff. You muted yourself, Nick. Huh. That's interesting. That's an amazing mouse click, apparently. Um, so they, uh, sorry about that. Anyways, uh, they did administer the meds. Uh, kid was still seizing, um, and then they transported. Um, so just some things that stood out to me. Um, they did give another four milligrams per set IN. Um, and then took, uh, took the kid all the way to their uh, facility of choice. Um, kid did stop seizing. Um, once again, kind of deferred to mom with that. Like I all once again, just reiterate, you know, like that's really tricky when even mom's not sure if he's still seizing or not and just kind of deferring to that caregiver. Um, and so uh, that was kind of just well done on their part. Um, anyway, they, I, I thought a well run call um, and they did a good job. Um, Directed to her Sherry. The only thing I will note, um, there was no uh, use of waveform capnography whatsoever, um, which is just something, especially um, for actively seizing patients. I know at first you're, you're going to worry about the seizure and not the treatment, but um, especially if you continue to transport and you're monitoring kids who've gotten pretty significant doses of benzos along the way, um, it really might benefit um, to kind of watch that waveform capnography there. Um, it'll just 
yeah, at least gives you an avenue alarm if nothing else. So, uh, then we had a call review for 183, who's uh, another one of our seizure kiddos. Um, actually, a history of Wolf, Horsh, uh, Wolf Hirschhorn on him, um, of course, which seizures are, are frequently common with. Um, and so this young man also lives a, a pretty good distance. Um, they had a long transport time um, with this kiddo. Um, once again, dispatched for an active seizure. Um, family kind of says, hey, you know, has this been going on for 20 minutes? Um, he also has a fever. Um, we've been giving him all of his home emergency medications. Um, in fact, I believe family was in the middle. They were going to transfer themselves. Um, but then just got kind of concerned um, with him continuing to seize. They didn't want to put him in the car um, and drive him themselves. So uh, they did activate 911. Um, and so the father kind of reiterated the care plan to them. Um, but um, unfortunately, the services run this a few times, but they did try another dose of Versed first. Um, but the family in this case does not run the home. It is one of the, the few situations where we have that in play. Um, and so they, uh, the crews grabbed the Keppra um, and did administer. It did actually take them a, a few IVs. I believe it was four IV attempts before they got a successful one. Um, so they did do another dose of Versed in the meanwhile, and then um, then they finally got a line while transporting um, and gave the kid uh, his Keppra. So, Nicholas. Um... We're anticipating, Collier County EMS is anticipating, we don't know if it's going to happen, but we're anticipating a shortage of Versed, and uh, apparently manufacturers are behind or whatever, and we're uh, laying the groundwork to substitute Ativan in place of Versed. Um, while I was doing studying that, uh, although we have the dosages okay, there's uh, there's the literature equivocates whether or not Ativan is a great drug to use intranasally. So if we were faced with um, no Versed and we were switching to Ativan, uh, is your team okay with us either using it IM or we, we, we certainly can still try intranasally, but I don't know if your team is familiar with using intranasal Ativan. So probably a poorly timed moment. Dr. Laffey appears to be completely frozen at this moment uh, where I need him to answer you. I will say um, I've heard Dr. Siegler address this previously and I am Ativan is not recommended. Um, the, the pharmacokinetics are incredibly slow in that route. Um, so it is, you know, it's Iodavan's IV. Um, you know, I'd f actually forgotten the internasal, and I, I think the only challenge I would see with that is that uh, Ativan's pretty thick, and getting like a good spray in the nasal atomizer would be a, a real big challenge. Um, I will make sure that we connect, circle back to you with Dr. Laffey's answer, but what I suspect the answer is going to be is if, if we don't have her said, we're going to have to focus on the route of, of probably IV access, and if not that, talk about, you know, if the kid is still actually seizing, we may have to start an IO um, to get our Ativan on board is what I suspect his answer will be. Yeah. Um, but I, okay. can, you hear me? can you hear me, Nick? I can't hear you now, boss. Yeah. <clears throat> my, I was my, my, sitting in my office, and I just got the blue screen of death, and my <laughs> computer's rebooting, and so I just clicked back on my phone real quick, so I apologize for that. Um, but I, I think yes, I agree with everything you just said. I, um, I'm, I don't think there's, I, you know, how what what effectiveness there would be intranasal. The other thing I don't know right off the top of my head is the concentration and volume. That'd be the other thing I don't know what it is right off the top of my head. Um, it'd be interesting to put some in a syringe and squirt it and see what happens, you know, out of the out of the atomizer just to kind of see. Um, uh, so I, the, that'd be the other, uh, you know, the, uh, good good questions. Um, well, we w we will make every effort to divert what my Dazalam um, we have in the system to the stars uh, children. Uh, if indeed we uh, look like we're running out, we're just trying to lay the groundwork right now because we have very few backup doses left. Um, I don't know what what happened to the manufacturing of this drug, but um, 
I will take that, uh, your recommendations. We will not uh, create an alternative through uh, IM Ativan, uh, nor will we do intranasal. And we will, if, we, if we're in a corner, we will try to start an IV. But as you well know, these are tough IV starts. Yeah. And you know, an IO wouldn't be unreasonable either if he's, you know, if they're if they're actively seizing. Um, that okay. Be another thing to think about. Um, Dr. Lafferty, your your voice just broke up, but I think you said it's okay to use IO if we have to go to that alternative. Sure. And if there's one thing I could recommend on that front, sir, is I should be back. Sorry, Dr. Laffey, you're kind of cutting out pretty bad there. Um, I will say we just we've had a couple uh, a previous meeting where we discussed um, just uh, sometimes talking your providers through and coaching them through um, explaining IOs to parents a little bit, um, just because in our experience, sometimes, you know, it, parents don't always have the like medical understanding side. Um, and they just view it as an completely barbaric act, you know, of like, what do you mean? You're like grueling into my kid's bones. Right. Um, and so sometimes just, you know, leading with like, hey, here are some ways you can talk to parents so that your newer providers, especially if they haven't had to have those conversations before, they kind of have that script for them a little bit ahead of time. The the six or so uh, patients that we have in Tyre County, has, uh, has STARS done any education of the uh, families about the possibility of intraosseous infusion or? I would have to um, I would have to defer to uh, the Galasano team on that. So um, I certainly don't mind reaching out and asking them just kind of where they are. I know they're educating and rolling out, but I don't know okay. what it looks like on the ground there. It certainly would facilitate our explaining that to the families that they had seen or heard anything about it before. And it's in our packets that we give to all the families too. Hey, Dr. Tober, it's Nikki. I know Angie's on, so we can Hi, talk Nikki. more about this later too. Awesome. Good discussion. Um, so uh, the kiddo did get his. Uh, sorry, just to finish out this call, review, kiddo did get his um, Kepra, um, and then you know just some of the good. Uh, once again. Got the caregivers involved. Um, I've painted and administered a specialty home med. Um, once again, kind of waveform capnography was missing, which I noted. Um, also, just it, I know we always like have to deal with the major emergency in front of us, but some things that kind of stood out. They said this kid had a 1045, and there was just really no discussion of um, you know potentially trying to uh, cool him down at all. And then just uh, just a smile noted not to be a the harsh qi officer but i mean you got 38 minutes of patient care on a sick and critical kid and there were only two sets of vital signs so just always that thing that stands out to me um all good that, reminders awesome um so i think i kind of already talked through the, the talking points as we did them but just um kind of some things that came through both these calls um you know using the caregivers and and just sometimes that challenge that care has already been rendered prior to your arrival. So kind of keeping track of, you know, what that is and the effects of that. Um, both of these were direct to tertiaries with over 30 miles of transport on both. Um, so I thought that was good. Um, and then we, we discussed the capnography. Um, I just want to address, um, we had one district just kind of um, uh, question us real quick when we reached out for a trip sheet. And so um, I was just going to, uh, remind and point out to everybody that when we have the parents sign the HIPAA waiver, part of what we do tell them is like, hey, we are going to collect information from 911 calls that do happen so that we can do QI and improvement and, and all learn from it together. Um, so please, if anybody ever has any questions or, or uh, concerns about that, feel free to reach out to me and I will give you all the paperwork and uh, we'll just, I just didn't want uh, districts to be surprised if you know somebody from a star team calls them and says like, hey, can we get the trip sheet uh, to see how that uh, 911 call went? So. Cool. Um, for our 2022 metrics, so this is um, current state today. We got 980 active stars. Um, for last year, we added a total of 284. 
Um, and um, you can see, I, I won't go too far in this, emergency activation is kind of holding steady right around 100 per month um, there at the end. Um, and dispatches, um, we, we did have more dispatches for the year um, and kind of ended right around, uh, I think it averaged around 20 a month. So um, I, I think uh, for just like maybe one or two more months, St. Charles County will get to be king of this list. Um, but Lee County MS is, is hot on your heels. So um, I think they will pass now in fairness to them. If we threw all of St. Charles or St. Louis County together, we probably could affect those numbers. But um for all of 2023 so 310 911 transports that we're aware of oh uh, the you can see that um over 70 percent of those kids did get admitted um and then uh 20 percent did not and then we had some unknowns um in there as well especially for kids um transported to alternate destinations um this number you know will continue to track over time here but um you know for those 310 calls, we saw 92% went direct to tertiary um, to their pediatric facilities. So um, I thought that was noteworthy. Well, kind of as I discussed in a meeting with some of the other stars people last week, you know, I we, we're just now tracking all these numbers. So I think this is an, uh, an excellent benchmark for the first year. Um, and then we'll just kind of keep track of what we think affects this in the future. Um, but I, I, as I like to say, like 92% uh, is an A in any classroom in America minus if you're the tough one. Um, we do look at kids who stop at outside facilities. Um, uh, we looked at 18 of those cases um, and just do kind of measure the time that that kid is there until they get picked back up and transferred to their tertiary care. Um, and so, and this could be, you know, 100% appropriate stop, right? Like if you are four hours from St. Louis, you might have to stop at a closer facility. Um, but we are just kind of trying to be aware of like, okay, if if they don't get directly to tertiary, how long do they sit there? Um, and so the average is 3.5 hours um, for last year. Um, it probably no surprise to anyone that of all the STARS calls, respiratory distress and seizure were the top two. Um, that makes sense because those are the two most common uh, for the general normies as well. Um, so, oh no. Yes, Dr. Um, so other than that, um, sick cases was the other one that came in and you can see where a bunch of those would fall underneath a sick case description. We did look at the non transports as well. Um, and so this is non transports by month and then just overall for the whole year by agency. Um, and then these were just some of the reasons for them. Um, and so there were um, some notable ones and we've done some call reviews on some of those all along the way here as well. And I'll, maybe I'll try to pick a month where we'll just do non-transport call reviews as well to kind of look at some of those situations. Um, I could not have this meeting without our attendance awards. And so for 2022, I mean, by by just one person not logging in one day, but uh, I, I joking aside, a huge thank you to Central County, um, Collinsville, um, and it's really amazing you guys are logged in every day i suspect jeffco is too you're just spread across two accounts um but kudos uh, and thank you to all the the dispatching agencies that are logging in every day and have the system ready to go um and i think we we saw that with the uptick in dispatches for 2022 um it's really paying off so um thank you guys uh for 2023 uh, couldn't help but drop a little david bowie we got just a few changes going on around here um but uh we will be hiring a, a new position here um at glennon and then um also i don't know if she wanted to be out or not but st louis children's has also um approved a stars position um so if anybody wants to come be my boss you'll get a chance to apply for that in just a few minutes um well you'll apply against me but um so and then uh, just to keep up with IT changes, um, we have our prioritized list of things we're working on, but just to kind of give you the, the gist of what will impact all of you in this meeting, um, we're going to work on improving that user interface for the admins, how you control employees, see employees, see what's going on with employees, um, just to make that component easier for you is, is kind of the next set of goals. Um, for training, um, we'll continue to work on the LMS and then um, also get around. I will say we're probably slowed down just a tiny bit at, at the start of the year here. We will do any just in time if you get a brand new kid 
um, or you have a, a kid you're really concerned your your providers aren't ready for, um, we'll still come out and do the training. But as far as just the like four CEs, keep it up. We're, we're probably looking at like scheduling in March and on from uh, for this year for right now. So um, for the next future meetings here, I'm always open to topics. So I thought it was a good discussion earlier about the Ativan. If there's things that come up like that that you would like uh, us to address. Um, Nick, you're muted yourself again. I, there's there's some bad mumbo jumbo in the universe today. All right, um, hands in there. Uh, so any, any topics that you want, um, anything special you'd like us to discuss, um, I will. I, there's no topics. I'll probably try to do call reviews because those are usually pretty popular. Um, and I hope I didn't break anybody's heart, but I did not include a December stars meeting this year. Um, it, I know we always kind of struggle more with attendance by the end of the year, and so I just thought in deferment for that. Um, so that is everything I had just to talk through for our half hour today. Um, were there any other open session questions or comments? Is it possible on your IT list of your wish list to add the like site administrators to the draft notice? I know our medical directors get the draft notices, but um, I think that we have several plans and draft that I don't know about, and I wish that we would get notification on that so I can nag the right people. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I will make sure it's on there. I think that's on the list, but I'll double check with Ms. Pam. Uh, uh, Nicholas, uh, for Dr. Laffey, we, uh, I'm happy to send you our draft once I modify it a little bit more of uh, uh, being forced to uh, substitute Ativan if and when we get to a point where we just can't buy any more uh, midazolam. Yeah. I'll send that through uh, Nikki Shimko and uh, she can distribute that to whomever um we should actually be able to finish that draft today i i thought i finished it yesterday but i want to change these things about i am and i n uh out of band and then swing that back to you yeah, that's kind of that's kind of scary <laughs> and, well if it's if, if we can't buy my dazzleam that's that starts to sound like the rest of the country won't be able to. right exactly yeah no question so Feels like we're back to the dextrose shortage problem. Like, yeah, one of the main things is gone. These drugs, when they come off patent, uh, nobody's interested in making them because they're not making any money. Right. So it it really just it always makes me. And that that call was an, uh, was a great example. That just the real need for a second line drug in the pre-hospital setting. We just don't really have anything good right now. So we have those few cases where we've got some Kepra in the right hands, but it doesn't seem like it's gonna be, at least right now, a, the, the right answer. But just the the idea that you just have one 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 bullet, you know, just benzos is, it's just unfortunate when you have these longer transport times. It's it's one of those times and we, we constantly are trying to match what we do in the hospital in the field. Anytime we can, you know, we can do it in the hospital let's do it in the field and then this just seems to be a real sticking point where we can't you know we can't find the way to get that second line drug there so you just keep pounding those extra doses of benzos and um just it's just suboptimal don't have a good answer i keep wondering if maybe ketamine might be it but i think it, we need to find the right way to study it well that's exactly what i was going to bring up is that the uh up to date and some other uh uh, monographs do detail uh, the ability of ketamine to uh, stop seizures, but certainly we are not. We do carry ketamine uh, for airway emergencies, um, but we have never used it as an anticonvulsive. Yeah, there's a, and the folks from Children's can speak to it, but there is a, we do have one kiddo here in the area that uh, that has gotten it several times pre-hospital for seizures, and it's been very successful. Um, I know the data on it is is really limited. Um, it's super tempting because it's there. Like you said, you got it already. Boy, you know, I heard it might be a good thing. Um, so the temptation to use it is, is going to be great. I think it might be 
I think there's some possibility that'll be very promising. Um, I, I hope we can get some real, some decent data would be nice to, to build on. Um, so we'd have, like, like you said, something, something to fall back on after that benzo doesn't work. Right. Well, we would be happy to support you in that once you uh, gave us a, uh, uh, a go ahead and a suggested protocol for that yeah. use. Yeah, and I know, uh, do, are you aware of any studies in progress on that, Dr. Laffey? Uh, no, not that I've seen. I mean, I, I think the last time I looked up that was maybe a couple of months ago, um, but I haven't seen or heard anything. A lot of times when you do the searches, it'll give you the, you know, give you the, the protocols in progress and that type of thing, but I haven't, haven't seen anything. Um, it'd be interesting to talk at maybe one of the bigger meetings and, you know, kind of uh, get a feel for whether anyone's looking at that or where that might come from. Awesome. I know Peter Antevi's presented a couple of case presentations on it, but I right. don't think it's anything big. Yeah, that's the that's kind of the bummer is that not that's a bummer, but it that's those are referenced quite a bit. That's what people fall back on. Well, you know, Peter Antevi says it's great. Yeah, and it's, it's just, just un it's unfortunate. It's not really a study. It's just a you know they tried it here and there, and it, that's the way a lot of these things start. I mean, it's not a bad way to get started, but. Um, well, yeah, it's the same with double sequential defib. Right, right? exactly, right. <laughs> just one guy who was awesome, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Until so you blow up your defibrillator and they won't pay to fix it. Well, now there's literature on it, so, yeah. I'm still not sure they're going to pay to fix it if you break your defibrillator. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Well, in the interest of everybody's time, uh, we've reached 930, so um, I'll hang on if anybody has any questions or wants to talk about anything. Um, but other than that, everybody else, thank you for uh, attending today, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you later and more this year. Thank you all, and have a, uh, a great day and a great week. Thank you. You too, Doc. Thanks, Nick, I'm going to hang out. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, Stephanie, hang out for a second. I get all the notifications um, and the reminders. So there's already some kind of setting in there um, because I do get them when they're pushed to the physicians and that. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's because you're in as an org admin. Um, got it, got it, got it, got it. Which, you know what, because you're the only one, you know, let's, here we go. Let's let's just see something real quick. This time. <laughs> yep. So I blatantly break the rules on a recorded meeting. You could maybe stop recording. I was gonna <laughs> say stop recording then. <laughs> uh, there we go.